Uh, so I'll spend the next 15, maybe 20 minutes or so uh, just focusing really on one specific study that we are currently uh, engaged with that's looking to explore the role of the virtual environment during exercise. Before I get into the specifics of the study, I just want to try and set some background so we try and understand um, where the study sits, maybe in the, in the broader context. We know that people struggle to initiate exercise and we know that people struggle to maintain exercise. And there's a, a re-emergence of, uh, of, of a topic, it's sort of exercise hedonics or affective responses to exercise. We're very much interested in how people feel during exercise and how that predicts subsequent exercise behaviour. So the current literature in this systematic review here published a couple of years ago suggests that it's how they feel during exercise. We know it's a challenge to get people to exercise. Once we get there, we need to make them uh, or try and encourage them to have a positive exercise experience. And that's where this study is very much grounded in. Also, I think a point to mention at the outset is exercise intensity. Exercise intensity is important, important in terms of determining how people respond to exercise. Typically, the higher the exercise intensity, the more displeasure that people will report. Um, and, uh, but we know that the harder people work, the more health benefits they can get from that. So we have to try and find a bit of a balance of trying to ensure a positive exercise experience while still people working at an exercise intensity that can garner uh, positive sort of physiological adaptations. So this work is very much um, within that framework of trying to promote positive feelings during exercise and trying to develop innovative and creative strategies to facilitate that. We've done a couple of studies that have, have, have sort of brought us to, to this point. Another important point to note is this line of investigation is, is very much predicated on the notion that the more we can distract you during exercise, the better you will feel. And that is distraction from bodily sensations. If you pay a lot of attention to bodily sensations during exercise, typically you feel a bit worse. So we're looking to distract you from those during exercise. And this article we published back in 2014 with some colleagues at Brunel University and Iowa State, um, we found some evidence for this relationship. So the greater the dissociation, the attention of dissociation, the more pleasure. So the more we were distracting people, the better they were feeling. So we were thinking about ways in which we can extend this line of investigation. How far can we push it? How far can we distract people? And does that always translate to them feeling better? So we wanted to try and create an immersive <coughs> environment to really try and um, immerse people in the external stimuli. This particular piece of work was looking at music and video, and we sought to extend that, uh, that particular stimulus, in, term, in terms of a low immersive or a high immersive condition. It took us a few years, but we got there. This study was published uh, early this year, and we were looking to explore the application of music and video during exercise with differing levels of immersion. So we made use of, you can see down here, this is a Samsung Gear VR. So we made use of this low-cost technology to try and create a highly immersive condition. And we compared that condition with more typical applications of music and video during exercise. So what you typically experience at a gym perhaps. So the music video was playing on TV and the uh, music was coming out of the speakers. Compared to this highly immersive condition with the headset and the headphones, compared to a control condition. Now this figure in the top right hand corner uh, indicates people's feelings during exercise. When we talk about feelings, the feeling scale in this context, it's just a rating of pleasure to displeasure. And the blue line indicates high immersion, and we did indeed find that the more people were immersed, the better they felt during the exercise. So, proof of concept, we can push it a little bit further, and there is a continued relationship. The more you are distracted by an external stimulus, the better you feel. So, we wanted to explore it a bit more. How much further can we push this? We're very much interested in this emergence of low-cost consumer-level technology. We've got a picture of the Oculus Rift here, and some of you may be familiar with the HTC Vive, we just saw the Samsung Gear VR. There's lots of different types of this technology around. And we want to really see whether we can capitalize on it and whether we can increase the potency of some stimulus that we know already works. There are a couple of key terms that are relevant for this study. 
We have immersion and we have presence. So immersion within VR concerns the technological <coughs> aspects of VR. So the field of view, whether that's 360 or sorry, 360 degrees or anything uh, less than that. Display size, uh, resolution, frame rate, technical, sorry, technological aspect. And then we have a related but distinct concept, presence. Presence is the extent to which you feel like you are there, in this virtual space. And it's an illusion. But we know it's an illusion. It's a perceptual rather than a cognitive illusion. So, to try and exemplify this, if you are walking through virtual space, and you suddenly find yourself on the edge of a cliff, you will respond, you will react. But then a few seconds later you will, know, you will sort of acknowledge that I'm completely safe, I'm not really on the edge of a cliff. But it's already happened, your response has already taken place. So it's working on a perceptual uh, approach. And that is essentially what VR is doing. It's a perceptual illusion. But it works because your responses take place before your cognitive processes catch up and tell you that this thing isn't really there. So we were looking to capitalize on that. And there's two uh, facets of a virtual environment that distinguish whether it promotes presence or not. One of them is the degree to which you can interact with the virtual environment, and the other is the, fidel uh, the fidelity or the realism of that environment. So for this particular study, we uh, were interested in that presence aspect, and whether we could uh, elicit high levels of presence and whether that transferred to feeling better or not. So the level of immersion, the technological level of immersion was the same because we were using the same technology, with similar field of view, similar resolutions and so on. But it was the presence that was, that was different. In VR, presence, in sort of mainstream VR uh, literature and research, presence is really seen as the holy grail. That is what the developers are constantly trying to create. But we don't know whether that's relevant in an exercise context or not. Do we need <coughs> that level of content? Is that going to work? So we tried to find some conditions or some software that would enable us to answer these questions. But we couldn't. We couldn't find off-the-shelf software. So there, was, there is 360-degree video footage. You can find it on YouTube. There's lots of other websites that might host it. But we couldn't find footage that was suitable for our project. Often it wasn't of sufficient duration. So there might be short clips, a couple of minutes, but that's not appropriate for continuous exercise. Often footage would fade in and out, and that's going to shatter the illusion. You very much realize that you are there. Often incongruent with the exercise task, so something very different is happening in front of you that is not exercise, uh, and that can lead to sickness. And uh, there's a lot of static shots where you can, you're, it's a camera placed in the middle of a scene, and you can look around, so it's 360, but we needed something that had some congruence with an exercise task, in this case, cycling. With regard to a virtual reality condition where we're trying to elicit that greater sense of presence, again, we couldn't really find anything. Many of you will be familiar with Zwift. Uh, that's a, a very popular platform for, for cyclists. And you can use that in, uh, within sort of virtual reality, but it has very limited interaction. If you speed up or slow down, the avatar will speed up or slow down, but you can't really steer, you can't really interact with the environment. So we struggle to find uh, appropriate conditions out there. So we had to create some. Uh, and that was a, a significant task. Uh, we're going to take a look at the conditions we created shortly. But something we, we uh, had to be very mindful of was cyber sickness. This is a big issue if you are particularly new to VR. Has anyone ever experienced cyber sickness in VR? Yeah, it's, it's pretty unpleasant. Um, and clearly, if you're feeling sick during exercise, you're not going to be feeling very pleasant. So we needed to create conditions that did not elicit sickness, a challenge. Um, so that required a lot of um, a lot of piloting. I'm going to skip that a bit because I don't want to go too much into sickness. Anyway, here's our, our, our two conditions. So this was our 360 degree condition. Some of you may recognize this if you've been down to Lady Bell Reservoir. This was filmed at approximately 6.30 in the morning on the back of a tandem bike. Um, we had... Yes. We had six GoPro cameras um, that were on a 360 mount that we printed with a 3D camera. Uh, yeah, the 3D uh, printer sorry, here at, at Hallam. And you can see this is quite high quality footage. So you can see the reflection on the water, you can see the early morning mist, you can see details on trees. You can look around this environment as it's traveling through 
through, through Lady Battle. So you can take a look at the plotter if you want, if that's particularly interesting to you. But if you speed up and slow down on the bike that we use, it does not speed up and slow down. If you steer the bike, it does not uh, steer. So it just continues playing regardless of what you're doing on the bike. So that was our 360 uh, degree condition. Then we created a virtual reality condition. So very much thanks to uh, Professor John Wheat and Stephen Florence, who works over in uh, the faculty to help create this condition. So we uh, re recreated the bike virtually, you'll see that in a second, and if you steer in this space, uh, sorry, if you steer in real life, you will steer around the space. If you speed up in real life, you will speed up in virtual space. If you go up a hill, you will, it will get harder and so forth. So there's a lot of interaction with the environment. And that's really what we're trying to do to separate that level of presence between the two conditions. I just go off road very slightly here just to show that you can go anywhere you want in this environment. Um, but interestingly, many people stuck to the paths, but that's a conversation uh, for another day perhaps. So this is what uh, our lab setup looked like, and this was also our control condition. So participants would then just cycle in a relatively visually sterile environment, um, and we would compare those two conditions. Principally interested in how people were feeling, so from pleasure to displeasure, and were their focus of attention was. Was it internally, on their bodily sensations, or was it externally? We also included a number of manipulation checks. Heart rate for intensity purposes, whether people were feeling sick, and whether um, people did indeed feel a greater sense of presence. This study is ongoing, um, so this is sort of preliminary data in this instance. Participants required to attend for Four separate visits to the lab. The first lab was a, a max, sorry, the first visit was a, a maximal test, and that was really important so we could create individualized um, workouts for the participants in subsequent labs so we could standardize the intensity at which they were working at. We took measures across the range of uh, the, the, the session. They were actually exercising for 20 minutes, but there was a, a short warm up and cool down afterwards. So, we uh, expected that the VR condition, where they had high levels of interaction, would elicit a greater dissociation, and that would translate to greater pleasure. In terms of our manipulation checks, the heart rate data indicated that all three conditions were comparable, so there wasn't significant difference. That's really important, because as I said at the start, if people are working harder, they'll likely feel worse. So, we had to ensure that people were working at similar intensities across conditions. Likewise, the presence uh, questionnaire administered afterwards indicated that there was a difference between conditions. That was great. We've managed to create some conditions where we could differ levels of presence. So people felt like they were more there in the VR condition than the 360 condition. And all this is showing is that nobody felt sick, which is great. So in terms of the slightly more complex analysis, this is the uh, output of the attentional uh, focus item. We do have a main effect for condition. This blue line here represents the 360 degree condition. And the main effect pertains to the difference between the 360 condition and the control condition. 360 condition elicited greater dissociative focus. People were more distracted by the 360 condition. This translated to a significant main effect uh, for the feeling scale scores between, again, the 360 condition and the, uh, the control condition. So, if you remember the hypothesis from approximately 90 seconds ago, you remember that uh, that's not quite what we wanted. So, contrary to our predictions, the 360 condition resulted in greatest dissociation. And similarly, elicited the greatest pleasure. So, we can create environments in an exercise context that elicit greater presence, but it doesn't appear that relevant in exercise. In non-exercise contexts, as I say, it's very much what people are trying to do. But in this context, it doesn't um, appear to add anything more than immersion. Being, simply being immersed in the stimulus appears sufficient to make it more pleasant. This is important in terms of um, developing future content, but this is obviously very preliminary data. 
terms of the content that we used, um, we, you'll notice that it was a nature-based environment, and we learned very heavily on some of the green exercise literature in terms of the positive outcomes associated with exercising in nature, and that was a strong basis for why we developed that content. But there isn't really a strong theoretical basis um, within uh, developing VR content for exercise, and that is a significant issue within this domain. It might not be that that type of content is the best. There might be lots of other types of things we can do that will elicit better responses than simply having people cycling through virtual nature environments. But we currently don't have a framework in place that enables us to select appropriate content. So I think if you're working in the area or you're looking to become more involved in the virtual reality uh, application sport and exercise, I think we need to be really mindful of the content that people are using during VR. And not to simply just go, VR is good or bad, but VR works or it doesn't. The actual content that is delivered in VR is, is, is crucial. And we don't really understand the particular qualities of that VR experience and how they translate to um, creating a more pleasant experience. If you're working with developers, please keep an eye on what they do. So for instance, Stephen Florence, uh, wanted to put a shark in the lake in the middle uh, of our virtual environment. So you can cycle down to the lake and a shark will attack you, but uh, obviously that's not really uh, appropriate. So please work closely with the developers if you're creating content um, and try and develop theoretically driven content. It's really important. There's, some other, there's always emerging technologies. This is something called a feel real mask. You can use this in virtual reality context and it um, it adds heat to the virtual environment, it adds mist, it can vibrate, it can do all sorts of things. But we don't, again, we still don't know whether this is going to work or be effective in an exercise context. But we're constantly striving for innovative uh, strategies that we can use to make exercise feel better. Another important point that I think can, uh, a criticism that can be leveled of much of this type of work, all we're doing here is assessing the efficacy of whether something can work over a short period of time. Whether that translates to effectiveness is a very different question. It might just be novelty effect that we're seeing here. We, we take steps to, to mitigate that, but we don't really know the long-term effects of these types of strategies, and that's work that, um, that we really need to do. I think that's probably giving you enough of an overview for now. Uh, so thank you very much for listening. Really, really interesting stuff there. Um, questions? Ben? Could there be um, an uncanny valley effect that the VR simulation was was nice, but clearly it wasn't a real natural scene, whereas I mean, the video was beautiful. I was in trance from here watching it. Um, and that people perhaps perceived it was worth paying attention to a genuine scene rather than something that was just a simulation. Perhaps, uh, perhaps, yeah, and we did strive for the best level of realism we could create in a virtual environment while uh, keeping it affordable. Unfortunately, that was a factor, um, but also the amount of processing that we could handle uh, in terms of making it a smooth experience. But yeah, certainly the, just the, the visual appeal of those two, uh, the, the difference in the visual appeal of those two conditions was, was probably a factor as well, or is probably Cool. What what uh, sounds were being played? Very good. So uh, previously, the work we've done in this domain has, has been playing music to people, but we wanted to try and take that uh, aspect of it out. So they were listening to basically a, a nature track. Mm -hmm. So when we, in that we I say we're out, we're back of a tandem bike. We didn't play the original track that was recorded at that point because no one needs to hear two blokes uh, breathing heavily on the bike. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, we, we, we substituted that out and we, we just played a, a nature track that was the same across both. Okay. Thanks, Lane. A bit more of a, an observation slash question for this, but um, I had a go on it uh, one time when you were in the room waiting for participants. And I don't know if there's a bit of a, a disassociation between the movement on the bike was just handlebars in that kind of direction, mm -hmm. whereas when, when you're on a bike and you're moving around, there's a bit more sort of camber to your movement, and I don't know whether that might have detracted away a little bit from the experience per se. Um, so that was just an observation from my perspective, but uh, it, my question would be about the longevity of it and how how VR is going to 
manifest itself within the research from here on out and looking back to what the we was like, do we see this as a bit more of a, a potential fad? Stuff that I've kind of done myself as well. Um, clearly there is you know, a chance that it's going to be a fad. Um, there is significant investment behind it by very large companies who will want to see this succeed. Um, but a lot of it depends on the content that is developed. I think people are expecting VR to have taken off more than it has done by now. Um, but there are new um, headsets coming out. Uh, I think it's the Oculus Quest, which now doesn't require uh, you to have a, a super powerful computer, it's a standalone device. So I think the more mature the, the, the technology gets, the more uh, it will appeal to people. But I think there's also augmented reality, which uh, will also be very popular. Uh, and whether that captures on or can be used in an exercise context will be interesting avenue to explore. Okay. So uh, you did show that, you know, from a physiological point of view, they all, you know, achieve the same uh, percentage of after the market. What was exactly the task they asked them to perform to make sure that they were actually training rather so, than having a strong environment? Yeah. Um, so we had the, uh, so we did the max test first of all. Then in the uh, control condition and the 360 condition, we uh, set the turbo trainer. Uh, a set wattage that corresponded with the ventilatory threshold. Um, we know that point is crucial in terms of affective responses and we get variable response at that point. But in terms of physiological adaptations, it's a, it's a good place to be at. Um, so we set that as, as the marker. In the VR condition, we asked them to, um, ex I'm trying to remember the wording exactly, it was a little bit a while ago, but basically we asked them to moderate their intensity of exercise so they could last for 20 minutes, um, but not Sort of easy. I can't remember the exact wording, um, but yeah, that was an important consideration so they weren't just ambling around the, the environment. Yeah. Steve? Um, I've seen quite a few systems which are more of a gamification type approach, which is still that distraction about exercise. In general, it's kids, it's you know, I, I've seen um, loads of them in the Netherlands, uh, Belgium, and so on. And they have whole suites of games which all have some physical activity component to them. So it's it's using kind of VR in a sense. It's using games which are very obviously not real. That they're not trying to take you out of your your, your presence here and taking you somewhere else. But kids do get out of the, the current place they're in and start playing these games, and they are in the game. So there is this kind of disassociation even though it's fairly obvious they're not there. Mm -hmm. So have you done anything on, on that, which is kind of almost a halfway? Uh, no, is the short answer to that. We haven't, unfortunately. Yeah. In terms of the gamification, um, we, we, we had conversations about this, so John and I had conversations about this, about whether we should be putting uh, sort of competition elements into, into the game, and I, I, I shied away from it. Uh, principally, some people, uh, are not driven by uh, competition, and that element of, a, of the virtual environment might switch them off, essentially, from what's going on. And also there's a chance that we're starting to um, facilitate the wrong type of motivation by engaging in that type of approach. They'll be engaging in the task to basically get rewards, and that's not really what to try and facilitate. We want them to engage in the task because they enjoy it, um, rather than Achieving uh, various mm. milestones. Mm. It's actually trying to get them to forget about the task, don't you? <laughs> about the physical activity? No. Not necessarily forget about it, but yeah, I understand what you're saying. Because there is an upper limit of, yeah. how, of how much they yeah. can forget about something. So yeah. we're probably working towards the upper limit of that. Right. If you go much harder than that, it doesn't matter what you do to someone, they're going to pay attention to the like screen. Yeah. Okay, yeah, they no, get it. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant. <coughs> Thanks, Lou. <Lynn. coughs> question or not, but there is some some limitation clearly you've got to be on a bike mm -hmm. or in a support because I can imagine if you're running oof, you're off. <laughs> so that for those people you know looking at alternate activities, what where else can this start to explore in terms of activities? Is it just cycling and 
Um, fairly static. static it, 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 I think currently, yes. I mean, there's also the issue of sickness that we have to uh, be very mindful of. If there's a, a significant incongruence between the task you're doing and the experience that you're having, then it's going to elicit sickness mm -hmm. um, quite sharply. But I mentioned augmented reality, and I think that's perhaps where there's a role for augmented reality in different modes of exercise. You can still see what's going on around you, but there might be other things <coughs> that we can create in the environment to change it, it might be a little bit more pleasant for someone. So I think in terms of different modes, augmented reality has a bit more. Thank you. Um,